All right, good morning, everyone, or good evening, or good afternoon, wherever you are today. Um, I am Laura. If you could just uh, do me a favor, if you are sat here today, you've just tuned in, I would love you to dump your favorite emoji into the chat window, and that way I know I'm not on my own at 5 a.m. So um, while you're figuring out what your favorite emoji is, I'm going to get started. Now, a little bit of a TLDR. It's 5 a.m. here and there is a three-year-old roaming the house somewhere. She's supposed to be asleep. So we're going to do the best we can. But if we get an extra guest, then we will just roll with it because resilience is part of security, right? OK, so um, let us get underway. Um, I am running off a single monitor due to the child problem. So uh, I'm going to switch screens. I'm going to be checking back in on you. Uh, see if there's any issues as we go. So don't be alarmed. All right, so my name is Laura Bellmain. Um, now, this is a little bit about me. I've done a lot of things. I started off as a software developer. I've done everything from real-time radiation monitoring software to counterterrorism, been a penetration test for seven years, and now I help organizations learn how to do security all the way through their life cycle from having a crazy idea on no code right the way through to where their product goes to live forever on the internet. Now, why are we here today? Well, we're here today because you're all good people. Now, that's nice and all, but in the context of this talk, it's actually a bad thing. You see, because we also think all hackers are bad people. Well, they might well be, you know, different from us in terms of their intentions in the world. But this simplicity, this good versus bad, white versus black, evil, uh, you know, it just doesn't work anymore. Um, so in today's talk, we're going to do a few things. I'm going to dig into why this good and bad are problematic words and why we need to start separating our actions from our intentions. You'll see why in just a moment. I'm going to get you to start embracing your bad behavior. Now, bear with me. Do not do crime. Crime is still illegal. Do not encourage others to do crime. That is also a very bad career limiting move. Um, but we're going to have a talk about how we can go a bit bad to make ourselves better. In fact, I'm going to be specific. I'm going to give you five simple steps that you can bring to your organization, whether it is big or small, to improve your security and your resilience. So let me just check that everything is still working. We're all good. So I think without further ado, we will get stuck into it. So what's so wrong, what's so bad about being bad? Well, let's talk about that. This page here is one of my favorite in this entire slide deck. It's not much to look at, but these are all of the words in the English language that are synonyms for the word bad. Now, some of them, you're like, oh, disruptive, uncontrollable, ungovernable. Oh, yeah, they sound pretty bad. But then you start getting further down and you start seeing that we also conflate being bad with being playful, prankish. Puckish, which is a very old word for those of you who are not English as a first language. Being bad, being naughty, breaking the rules, being playful are all seen as interconnected when really they're not. Let's talk about that. So this is me. I'm not very good at art, as you might be able to tell. I am nominally a good person. I have got here today because I haven't broken any laws in any significant way. I have followed the rules around me, whether I was at home or at school or later in my employment. And now I'm an employer, so now I make those rules. So by all intents and purposes, I am a good person. However, being a good person isn't always a good thing. It's also not always the truth. So. For those of you in the channel, I would love you to raise your virtual hand or, or do it in your head. It's OK. It's a virtual session. If you've ever told a lie, if you've ever cheated, if you've ever stolen something. Now, I don't want to know the details. What happens in your spare time? That's between you and whoever keeps your secrets. But the thing is, I know that I've told lies. 
I, even as a young person, I stole things. My first crime, a genuine crime, please don't tell the law enforcement people in the UK, is I was eight and I stole a pack of sweets, chocolate sweets, from a local shop where I grew up. I also stole a kid's rubber eraser from their pencil case at school because it was shaped like a pig and I thought it was amazing. Now, we tell lies all the time. I have children, I tell lies. I have to, that's sort of part of parenting. Don't judge me. But we do it in the sense that they're white lies, they're innocent lies. And now I'm going to make a little caveat here. The language here, white and black, I know is problematic. Um, well, it's a minefield, this subject, when you start looking into the, the history of language around us. So please forgive me, there is no intention there. But I tell lies, you tell lies. We all cheat and steal so long as nobody else gets hurt. We make that judgment as we do these things. So if we are all liars, cheats and thieves, then maybe being bad and breaking the rules isn't so bad. Well, this gets confusing, right? Because now we're saying, well, your crime is not the same as my crime and therefore your crime is different to mine and it's worse. Oh goodness, humans are complex beasts. You see, it's not about language. It's not about being bad or playful or puckish or any of those dozens of words. It's about the difference between our actions and our intentions. So when I describe my crime, my intention, you know, well, to be honest, it was very selfish. I wanted to eat chocolate or I wanted to have an eraser shaped like a pig. But it wasn't to gain a significant amount that was going to cause somebody else hardship, or at least in my eight-year-old view, it wasn't. And now that I'm an adult, now, when I tell a lie, for example, my intention is not to deceive somebody to the point of, you know, really damaging their worldview or deceive them to gain massive access or to corrupt something. My aim is to probably keep the peace. Um, if you can hear patting in the background, we've got a guest. This is uh, Misty. She's old and very cantankerous. Um, she's not evil either. We're going to put her there and hope that she stays out of the way. It's going to be that kind of morning. Oh, and we're off again. Fabulous. Right. So our actions and our intentions matter, but it's not the same as each other. You can choose to do one thing and not have bad intentions. Well, this is something that we need to dig into as software development professionals, as security people who are helping software development pro professionals. Because you see, being bad or breaking things isn't always about, well, breaking things. It's not always about causing a rift in the world. It's not about hurting others. Now, if that's the case, then we can embrace this. We can embrace going bad for the greater good. Now, bear with me, it will make more sense. How many of you are parents? Well, I bet a few of you are. I am. I have a three and a half year old and I have a nine year old. And this following dialogue happens in my house at least once a week especially with a three and a half year old. So I'll say, hey, don't touch that, please. You'll break it and then daddy will be cross. I mean it. I mean, I really do mean it. Oh, please don't make me count to three. One, two, three. Now at this point, as most parents, there's a loaded pause because you see what I've done here is I've lent into the idea that by breaking things will be bad and there will be consequences, but there's a reality check here, isn't there? You know, what am I gonna do at the count of three? Is it really that bad? Hmm, if you know this has been you, then bear with me, I'm gonna show you what you can do instead. Now, in our development world, we use this all the time, right? We say We don't say, don't touch this, we just say, don't break the build. We say, you know, oh, stay focused, only focus on the thing that you're supposed to be doing. We ask people to stick issues on a backlog rather than getting to them straight away. Now, there's many good reasons for that. But sometimes this focus, sometimes this focus on quick, quick keep going, don't break it, distracts us from some of our opportunities we have to make what we're doing stronger. So what could possibly go wrong with this idea that we're gonna go bad, and by going bad, that that's gonna be good. Well, let's talk about that. This will not end well. How many of you have that lingering feeling when you do something that you're not supposed to do? Now, if I was to put a big red button in front of you right now, 
some of you would press it straight away. Now, if I put a sign next to that button that said internet, now those of you who are old enough will know that's a joke from somewhere, many of you will choose not to push that button just in case. Now, we logically know it wouldn't turn off the internet or affect the internet at all, but there's part of us that is worried that what if, what if in that strange occasion by pressing that button, bad things happen? Well, that's what it's like to be an engineer. You see, we as engineers, we don't like breaking things. What's well, literally wired into us to fix things. We also don't like attacks to be simplistic. So when a box is put in front of you with a big red button that says, don't touch it, internet will break or similar, um, it would be very disappointing if a big red button that happened to be in your home right now or on your desk actually controlled the internet. It would be devastating because we feel horribly cheated as engineers if the attack is not sophisticated or elegant. We want the attacks against us, against us to be complex. We want them to have somebody who's really had to think it out. But most of the attacks on the internet, especially those that are opportunistic, are not sophisticated or elegant. They are the equivalent of somebody finding a big red button on a table and going, oh, I wonder what that does, and hitting it until something happens. You see, we're all romantics at heart. We've all watched those movies, whether it's the old school movies with, you know, train heists, or it's the newer movies where there's big casino robberies and you didn't just need one person, you needed a team of eight and you needed to plan it for three months to get it done. We all think that when our organization is going to be attacked, it's going to be very complex and it's going to take a lot of planning and we want it to be that way. And so we avoid looking at how it would work because, well, the reality of it being so simple would be devastating to us. We're engineers. We love to solve puzzles. We love the process of the puzzle itself. And so when we find simple ways to cause mayhem, it's actually kind of disappointing. Where's the challenge in that? Well, I'm going to hopefully get you to reset that and see the challenge in all of this instead of being about the original heist itself, being about solving it, because it turns out solving it is a little bit more difficult than finding it to begin with. Now, the other thing that we tend to do badly that we need to get past is the idea of blame. Now, I had the privilege of meeting John Allspore when he was the CTO um, of Etsy. This was many years ago. And he was one of the early, very loud voices in blameless software development culture. And that's important. Blamelessness is not something we do in security very well. We, unfortunately, and you can see it in the news all the time, when there is a breach, when there is an attack, we find somebody in a role and we say, hey, this was your fault. You should have tried harder. You should have done better. And we make their life miserable. In fact, in some cases, we just fire them. Um, now, when we're talking about embracing going bad and breaking things, we also have to talk about what happens when something gets broken. You see, if we're going to break something as somebody with good intentions, as a defender, then it's super important that we have a process that doesn't freak out when something breaks, that we don't look at the individual, but we look at the circumstances and symptoms that cause that issue. And until we can get to that, then we're going to be in a bit of trouble. Now, if you're from the security world and blameless culture is new to you, you can check out a lot of cool resources online for that. Um, any of the work from Etsy's Coders Craft has captured it many, many times over. Uh, but if you Google blameless uh, culture, or software development, blameless software development, all of these things will find you some great links. There's some great talks to watch. Because until we fix this part, the next part of this talk is going to be really challenging for you. So... We're about halfway through the talk time, and I'm going to use the rest of our time to talk specifically about five things that you, you today, whether you're watching this live or whether you're watching this on the recording, can do to get good at being bad and the benefit that it is going to give your team. Now, if you're a security person, you're watching this and go, I don't need to go bad, it's my developers who do, then what I'm teaching you here is the guide for what you can help your development teams with. If you happen to be a developer and you stumble across this talk, then this is something you can do yourselves. Now, I'm going to just also preface it. 
I named this talk badly and I named it badly a very long time ago and it sort of just stuck. I've said developers. Now we say this a lot in the development space. Uh, we say it to mean everyone in the software development lifecycle, but it really isn't everybody that writes code. So in these next bits, please remember, it's not just those who write code who could do this. It's also your product owners, your architects, your testers, anybody who could have a bit of a devious mind and have a play and teach you something on the way. So let's get stuck in. Firstly, be objective. Now, security professionals, we know this, right? We know there are common objectives as to why we're attacked. Now, some of it is just opportunistic, the types of attack, but there's still a motivation underneath it all. Those motivations are often being financial or political, egotistical, I want to prove that I'm better than you, or revenge-based. And that could be also related to inside jobs. So as engineering teams, we don't think this way. We often think we focus not on the objective, what has value, what is the target to our attack, because we think about the technology we've built, because that's our world, that's our frame of reference. So the first thing to do when you're going bad, going evil, as a development team member is to remember the objective of the attackers. So you have to figure out what an attacker would be interested in you for. Now, for some organizations, that's really clear. You happen to be the team that looks after the software that prevents a hydroelectric dam from flooding the small village. Yeah, it does exist. Um, and it's quite clear why somebody might want to attack that. But if you happen to just write a small e-commerce platform, or you write software that helps your business in a way that is about improving process, it's not, you know, a digital bank, then you need to look at why somebody could do you harm. And believe me, I wish there wasn't, but there's some objective for attacking anyone. Even as smallest organizations are vulnerable because of the way that financial gain works now. So think about ransomware, for example. That's not about the fact that these organizations are using this technology or that technology. It's not because they love .NET or hate Java. It's because ransomware happens because it makes good money and they opportunistically find organizations using technologies they can attack and they do that. So the money is the important thing there. That's the objective, not the technology. Now, Getting your development teams to understand that the technology is secondary to the thing of value they're protecting is really key. Now, remember, there are two kinds of thieves in the world. I love this quote. I genuinely do. The ones who steal and enrich their, steal to enrich their lives and those who steal to define their lives. Now, this is a really great quote when you start thinking about electronic harm and crime. Most of the attackers we see are the ones who steal to enrich their lives. They're stealing to do something that improves their life. They're not stealing because stealing is the aim of the game 99% of the time. And keeping this quote in mind can really help you focus on protecting what matters because if somebody's trying to enrich their life, they're trying to do it with something you have. So step two, think like a villain. Now, I remember earlier when I said that we are all a little bit uh, disadvantaged as engineers because we don't think like villains. We think like the good people. We think like people who build, who try and make the world a better place. Well, we need to embrace this if we're going to make our system safe. Now, for development teams, it's very easy for them to turn around and say, and they say to me, this to me all the time. I work with development teams all around the world and say, Laurie, you're paranoid. Like, I'm not paranoid. They really are out to get you. But the important bit here is it may not be about you. It might be the thing you have that's, inval that's valuable to them. So if we get rid of the idea that by talking about the bad things and identifying your villain that we're somehow paranoid, that we're tinfoil hat or whatever, we can actually make this into a game. So what we can do is we can learn how to tell bad stories. Now, let me just explain a little bit with a little bit of color here. In the software testing world, so not in security, not in software development and software testing, there is a man called James Whitaker, and he used to work for Microsoft. I don't know if he still does, he might well do. And he was one of the pioneers of what we look at now as software testing in terms of the scale and the culture of it. 
Now, he tells a story about how software testing was when he first got involved. When he first got involved, people would find bugs in software, but they would hide it. They would put the piece of paper to their chest and they would not talk about it. They would tell their colleagues in whispered voices they'd found a bad thing. Now, this was because they didn't want the person to feel embarrassed there had been a bug in the code. They didn't want shame. They didn't want all these bad emotions to be coming in. They also didn't want to be seen as bad because they'd found a bad thing. They'd broken it. James changed things uh, at his employers, and he did that by commandeering a wall. And instead of bugs and flaws and misdemeanors becoming this thing of secrets that were whispered in corridors, he started blowing up pictures of the bugs that he found, huge, and sticking them on the wall, somewhere very, very public where everyone would see. Now, the idea of this was not to blame and shame. It was to make it so that people would come to that wall and go, ah, oh, really? Did, did we find that? Where was that? That's amazing. And they started telling stories. They started telling stories of the bugs they found, of the things that had gone wrong. And in telling those stories, they found that people were much more open to identifying bugs. And not only that, they would take a bug that had already been found and go, oh, hey, if that exists here, I bet it exists here. Because did you know that the code is like 90% the same in that part of the system? Now, none of that happened before because these bugs were shared in secrets and whispers. And so nobody ever compared notes. Nobody ever went, hey, actually, yeah, we could do something about this. Now, we do this at the moment. We do that secrets and whispers. We hide our pen testing reports. We keep the details of the bounty program secret. Now, I know there's an argument that the more you share these things, the higher the risk that somebody will go evil. I'm going to tell you a bit of a truth, though. If your main concern is that the people who you vetted and interviewed into your organization are going to take a pen test result and suddenly decide to hack your organization, you're wrong. They're not wrong. You're wrong. Because... If somebody was fundamentally wired to go evil, to do harm, to attack your organization, they didn't need your pen test report to do that. They were already finding that information for themselves. So by isolating our stories of what has gone wrong, we actually do our defense a lot of harm. So I would love for you to take the stories, the bad stories, the stories of when it all went wrong from your organization and find ways to tell them, perhaps maybe, Putting them on a big wall is not the way forward. But what could you do instead? Could you run a session that tells the stories of when it all went wrong? Stories are an incredible motivator. They have been since the start of being humans, many, 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 many years ago to now. So get better at telling our stories, even the ones that make us a little bit upset and embarrassed. Step three of our journey towards being a bad person is to create a safe place for a little bit of chaos. Now, most software development environments have two or three stages, including a development environment, a test environment. Maybe you have shades of testing. You might have also a UAT environment. And then we have production. Now, it's highly unlikely that your organization is prepared for any of your development team to cause true chaos in any of these spaces. Now, first things first. All of your environments should be the same, right? We talk about this a lot, but we all know that this is not the case. Our development environment tends to be a bit more of the Wild West. Our test environment often is shared between way too many testers, and it has a fragility in it because our testers are now hamstrung because if they cause too much trouble, the other testers can't get their job done. And our production environment has the actual customers in. So causing chaos in the production environment, unless you're Netflix, tends to be a little bit of a problem. For those of you who aren't clear about the Netflix re reference, they have the idea of Chaos Monkey. Um, and in fact, the Simeon Army, which is an open source group of tools designed to cause chaos exactly that in their production environments. But let's get back to something you can do. You can create a safe place, an extra environment, if you will, that is representative of production. Now, I'm not telling you to put your prod data in that. That's still a bad idea. Please sanitize your data. Please use non-production data. But create a space where it's OK to go and press every button. Now, when you were kids, you were very good at this. When you were a kid, oh, well, when I was a kid, and I'm going to age myself horribly here, I was the kid who wanted to press every single button on something to see what happened. And then I wanted to press the buttons at the same time and see what happened. And then I, well, not me, but my brother would put a jam sandwich in a VCR, which, you know, 
first of that really is aging me, but putting things that are not designed to go with things together and just seeing what happened. You need to create the space for that to happen. Do you know why? Because that's how attack thinking works. It's not about playing by the rules and going, well, the manual says it should do this, so I'm going to do that. It's about saying, well, there are seven buttons here and this one's big and red. What happens when I push it? Now, the other side to this is it's also going to help your software testers out a lot because there are still systems out there where we're not allowed to taste, test it properly because it might hurt people, because it might cause harm. If you have anything in your environment that cannot be fully tested because it might hurt somebody, then you're doing it wrong. Create a space for chaos. Then I want you to monitor that space. You will be very surprised what you learn because monitoring a space that's intentionally filled of chaos and it, your development team are able to play in will teach you the types of things you will be able to look for with your attackers. This is much, much cheaper and much more thorough than a penetration test because it comes from a place of experimentation, engineering and play. And play is important. Now, we have a culture and security of rewarding the breakers and then just kind of saying to the the fixers, the people who build our systems, ah, oh, yeah, well, you should have got it right the first time. I want you to change that. Sure, it's great to find bugs. Finding bugs is easy. Fixing bugs is really hard. So when you're rewarding, when you're building this environment and building the culture around it, I want you to put incentives in place that are going to help people feel uh, incentivized not just to find the bad things, but then to fix them and make the world stronger. It's harder than it sounds. That could be swag, it could be financial, it could be weaving it into job descriptions so that people are rewarded in those official channels like pay reviews and extra responsibility and titles. Do what works for your culture. Number four, play like you never read the rule book. Now, this is handy for me because I'm really, really, I, I'm a bit of a chaos monkey with all games I play and the rule books are often serving suggestions rather than the, the main event. So you probably don't want to play several games with me. But again, going back to that engineering mindset, if you're built and wired to build things and to fix things and to make the world a better place, then playing and avoiding the rules and doing things that are a little bit outside that are bold can be really, really hard. So Make time to play is actually a skill we need to remember more. You were very good at it when you were young. You were playful and creative, but now you've been playing by rules, whether it's your employers or laws for a very long time. So make time to pretend those laws don't exist. Your attackers don't care that there's rules. Your attackers don't care that the law says they shouldn't do this. So by making sure that our development teams learn to play and ignore those rules from time to time, we make our defenses stronger. And finally, five, only three minutes remaining, and you're going to get there just on time, I promise. This is not just a one-off thing. This is not a hackathon in your office. This is not something you aspire to in a 30-minute talk led by a stranger on the internet and her cat. This is something you have to do for life. Security needs to be a continuous noise. You need to make it okay for people to be slightly chaotic and, ca and playful in your development area every day. You need to make it okay to break things, even when the timing isn't great on breaking things. Security doesn't work when it's a special event. It doesn't work when it's a special team. It's not going to take the team of 3.5 million open cybersecurity jobs today to fix this. It's going to take the team of 30 million software developers that exist in the world right now. And it's going to take all of them being incentivized, rewarded, and made safe so that they can become the voice of security in our software space. Now, let's wrap this up. I've got to end on a really positive note. I've got one more thing, so hold on. Watch this space. So being good and bad are problematic words. They're overly simplistic, and I want you to avoid them because I need every single one of you to learn how to be a little bit naughty, to go bad, to be playful or puckish. And I've given you five steps in this talk, creating safe spaces, understanding the objective of attackers, playing and doing this continually that will help bring security behaviors to your whole development team. Now that one more thing. If you want to do this, and there's no tricks, this isn't a sales pitch, because if you've seen me on LinkedIn in the last few days, you've known I've leaned into a mission. I'm trying to train a million software developers and I'm trying to do it for free. No tricks, no strings. So if your organization would like to learn how to break bad, then come along. Free training, all organizations anywhere in the world, now and forever. So that will give you five seats for your entire team. And I'd love to see you there. 
Right, you can contact me at any time on these things. But I would love to talk big and bold and breaking bad. And if there are any questions, then pop them in the chat. Um, and if not, enjoy the rest of your conference. Thank you.